I would like to introduce now Mr. Vladimir Zuro, commissioner retired, who worked as a criminal detective between 1983 and 1995, initially investigating violent crime with the Criminal Investigation Department in Prague, and later at the National Central Bureau of Interpol in Prague. In 1994, Mr. Zuro actively participated in the work of the United Nations Protection Force, UN Prof, in the former Yugoslavia. In April 1995, he began a 10-year stint as an investigator with the Office of the Prosecutor at the International Criminal Tribunal of the former Yugoslavia. Vladimir currently works as a Chief of Headquarters Office at the UN Office of Internal Oversight Services in New York. Mr. Tsuro, it's an honor to have you with us today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good morning to you. Uh, I would like to thank the Academy for the invitation. Thank you. It's an honor for me to be standing here. I worked for the UN for 25 years. It's for the first time for me to be standing here. It's usually a place for the politicians, for the presidents and the prime ministers. So I'm one of those. Uh, so I will start talking about the investigation of the war crimes in the former Yugoslavia. But before I start with that, it's very important that we understand one thing. There might be some students from the former Yugoslavia here, and uh, I'll be using the specific examples. Please, we shall leave the demons of the war sleeping, because a lot of bad things happen in the former Yugoslavia from all sides, from the Serbs, Croats, Bosniaks, and others. And uh, I'll be using an example of the crimes committed by the Serbs or non-Serbs in Croatia at no means that the others didn't commit crimes. I just want you to understand before I start with my presentation. Thank you. Because I'm a staff member of the United Nations, I have to make a disclaimer. Whatever I say here, if something is wrong or inaccurate, it's my own responsibility. It cannot be attributed to the United Nations or the International War Crimes Tribunal in The Hague. So all force are mine. And I'll be getting to it. Socialist Federal Republic of Yugoslavia existed in Europe between 45 and 92. And it disintegrated basically in 1990 and 1991 and brought the war to Europe for the first time after the end of the World War II. Terrible things happened there. Yugoslavia had the six states. And uh, with the fall of communism in Europe, there was a new democratic process and what actually brought to many of the countries new democratic governments, but also aspirations for independence. I come from Czechoslovakia at the time. We split Czechoslovakia into Czechia and Slovakia peacefully. It was not a case in former Yugoslavia. There was a war. You're lucky, most of you are lucky, that you don't have your own experience with the war. So I need to somehow show you what the war means in real terms. I bring Ozzy Osbourne to General Assembly. Ozzy is speaking about, or singing about, looking out the windows and looking outside. That's what we all do when we are home and look through the windows. We want to see something nice there. We don't want to see war, destruction. We want to be positive. We dream about the better world. But If you look here, this is how it looks when you look out of the window in New York. Manhattan, beautiful city, eight million of people living together. But if you look at the Croatia in 1991, it was very similar. The Croats, the Serbs, and the other nationalities lived together peacefully in something which was a better communist version of the state in Europe. There was a open borders, all looked nice on the outset. See, 
beautiful city Vukovar, Danube, and then the war came. After the initial skirmishes in the former Yugoslavia between different nationalities, the war in Europe for the first time started on the 25th of August, 1991, where the Croats and the Serbs started to fight for the city of Vukovar. And the Yugoslav army, which was a federal army, was supposed to keep the peace. They had the obligation, according to the Constitution, to keep the peace. But unfortunately, as the country was disintegrating, then the different nationalities were leaving the army. So the Croats left, Slovenes left. So the command staff of the army became Serbian and Montenegrin. And in a conflict, they leaned towards the Serbian paramilitaries in the city. So in three months, in three months, they turned this beautiful city you saw in the picture into this. The army didn't want to fight street by street. So what did they do? They shelled the city with artillery, with the tanks and, and air, air force to avoid the casualties. They completely destroyed the city of about 70,000 citizens, turned it into ruins. That's what I'd like to show you. You know, the war is not something what you see in the movies. If you don't like it, you can turn it off. Those people were the same like you and your parents. They lived in their homes. They took care of their business. They bought the houses and had the mortgages and the cars and the problems with the students, with the kids, of every other country and every other person in the earth. But then one day, in three months, the country was turned into ruins. Had an impact on everybody. Just move it back, please. Just move it back. One slide back. You know, under the Geneva Conventions, I'm not going to be preaching law to you, but under the Geneva Conventions, all the hospitals are protected because they need to provide service to all, not only to one side. That's why the Geneva Conventions provide the protection for the hospitals. At this particular conflict in Europe, the Air Force of Yugoslav Army dropped a bomb on the hospital. The bomb went through the roof to the basement, didn't explode, but caused a lot of damage. The war ended on the 18th of November 1991, when the Croats were not able to defend the country, the city anymore, and they surrendered. There was a meeting in Zagreb between the Croatian government, the Yugoslav army, and International Red Cross to negotiate that the civilians who, will be, who were left in the city will be evacuated. And the agreement was that on the 19th of November in the evening, the evacuation will start. But the Yugoslav army argued that it is not possible because it's not safe. So they move the, the evacuation of the hospital for the 20th in the morning. I will show you a short video of how it looked in Vukovar after the surrender. Can you just move the slide? You see the, you see the streets are full of people in complete misery. And the other group of people celebrating. There will be a song sung by one of the paramilitary Serbian uh, unit singing. Sloboda Milosevic, send us salad. We will slaughter Croats for the meat. You know, it will be funny if it was not in a post-conflict situation where emotions were high. You can't imagine them. And it's good that you can't imagine. The neighbors, neighbors were killing each other for three months. Croats, Serbs, Serbs, Croats. And then one party won and one lost. And this is how it looked. It's very important for you to see it to understand what happened next.
The Red Cross tried to get in the hospital on the 20th in the morning. The Yugoslav army officer, Major Slivanchanin, stopped the convoy, arguing that they couldn't go any further because it's unsafe. But it wasn't true. They need to do something. They sent about five buses and took about 300 people from the hospital before the Red Cross was allowed to come in. These people were taken to the buses, taken to the southern part of Vukovar in the JNA barracks, and then to a pig farm in Ovchara, which is about five kilometers south from Vukovar. But they were beaten there for the whole afternoon and eventually executed and dumped in a mass grave. 265 of the people from the hospital were murdered and buried in a mass grave. Now, we ask ourselves why. What would be the reason those people would be excluded from the others and taken to the farm and murdered? And we came across this. Can you just move it, please? That very morning, the Serbian media, controlled by Sobora Milosevic, were running news that Croats, those who lost the battle, slaughtered 40 Serbian children. What it does, what it does to people. Just imagine, try to imagine a situation when you have two conflicting parties. The one that wins is fed with the news, information, that those people who lost murdered their children. Now, the bond between parents and children is very strong. It's an attack on the basic instinct of all of us, human beings. Somebody killed my children. And now I have in my hands those people who murdered them. So, and I have a gun, and I'm drunk. What I will do with it? If those people committed some crimes, they were supposed to be prosecuted and brought to justice. But these paramilitary decided to do otherwise. As I said, they murdered them and put them in a mass grave. This news was picked by Reuters and others and ran across the world until the next day. Yugoslovenski fotoreporter koji je prijavio da je 41 dete bilo masakrirano blizu Vukovara, navodno od strane hrvatskih snaga, opovrgao je danas ključne elemente svoje priče, priznajući da nije video ni izbrojao tela. The next day, the news was recalled. It wasn't true. Too late for those 265 people. Too late. It was a fabulated news to attack the basic instinct of the people in the former Yugoslavia. It took 20 years to radio television of Serbia to apologize for this fake news. There was a number of them. It took 20 years to apologize for it. I'll move to the next slide. So this is the place where those people were brought by the Yugoslav army put into the hangar and kept there until the night came. The Yugoslav army, under the obligation of the Geneva Conventions, was supposed to protect those people, those detainees. But rather than fighting with the paramilitaries, they decided to give them up. And the commander of the unit, Colonel Merksic, ordered the army to withdraw. So they left them in the hands of the paramilitaries, which was basically sentenced to death. One of those, per one of those people who were among the detained, Zdenko Novak, was already on the truck being driven to, uh, to the site for the execution. And he decided to take his fate in his own hands. So what he did, he talked to his colleague next to him and said, let's jump, let's run away. And the guy says, don't be silly, they are going to kill us. He says, what do you think they are going to do to us? They are going to kill us. Let's take it in our own hands and run. And he didn't. So Zdenko Novak jumps. 
and runs and eventually survives. He's the only one who survived the execution because just before he got to the start, he escaped. He talked to the other person. You see, any of, of you know Indiana Jones movies? He is Indiana Jones, the real one. His name is Clyde Snow. He's a famous anthropologist. And he was sent by the, this organization, by the United Nations. The Secretary General sent him as a part of the Mazowiecki Commission to look into the war crimes in the former Yugoslavia. And Zdenko Novak and Clyde Snow met in Zagreb and talked to each other. And Zdenko told him the story about what happened. So Clyde Snow goes to the place and try to find the grave. And he indeed finds a grave in autumn of 1992. That's the grave. They start exhumation. They did a test range. They found about nine bodies, but the, national, the local authorities didn't allow them to continue with the exhumation. They tried to come back again. It was again denied. So the UN put the contingent of the Russian troops the, under, under the un, uh, UNPROFOR and they guarded the site until something happened. And what happened next? I tried to move it. Something happened here in this building, in the General Assembly. You probably have an opportunity to go and see the General Assembly. This is where the countries came together and decided to establish the International War Crimes Tribunal in The Hague to deal with the atrocities that happened in the former Yugoslavia. So the jurisdiction for the tribunal was established to deal with the grave breaches of the Geneva Convention, violations of the laws and customs of war, genocides and crimes against humanity. So this was something that happened here, but we look at what were expectations because the last time somebody tried the war crimes in, in the world was after the World War II in Nuremberg and in Tokyo, the tribunals that dealt with the war crimes committed in the World War II. So between 45 and 92, a long time passed. Can you move it, please? Play the video. I'd like to turn your attention to the issue this is a testimony of, of Secretary Albright before the tribunal the about the establishment of the, of the ICTY. Could the judges why the member states of the United Nations voted for the creation of a tribunal? What the concerns were, what issues it hoped to address, what goals it hoped to achieve? Well, I think that um, all of the people that were involved in it, the permanent representatives, uh, and the Security Council, as well as the non-permanent ones and others who were not on the Security Council, were very much aware that we were involved in something new, though discussing the Nuremberg precedents, that this was not a um, war of victors, that we were really dealing with a situation that was ongoing, um, that the procedures had to be established that would not only um, identify individual uh, guilt and expunge the collective guilt, but make sure that proper punishment was meted out. And it was, um, in many ways, being present at the creation of a brand new organization. I must say that we ran into a great deal of skepticism. Um, it was easy enough to take the first vote um, in February to get the, um, court, the tribunal created but nobody really believed that it would work. Um, there were questions about how the judges would be selected. Uh, I must say that um, especially the women permanent representatives at the United Nations wanted to make sure that there would be women judges because so many of the crimes had been committed against women in terms of rape and um, horrendous crimes. And so the judges were then um, selected by the entire UN system. Um, and then the question was how to get a prosecutor, and that was very complicated, and nobody thought that would happen. And then nobody thought that there would ever be a, um, a court that actually functioned that would be set on some what the precedents were going to be. And um, we then in May voted on how the, uh, of 93, voted on how the, the procedures of the tribunal 
would work. And then still nobody thought it would work. They said that there never would be any indictees, and then they said there would never be any trials, and then they said there would never be any convictions, um, and there would never be any sentencing. And at each part along the way, um, I would point out that they were wrong. And uh, one of the reasons that I think it is so important that this uh, procedure is going forward is to show that they were all wrong, that this, uh, that the tribunal is very much a part of the international judicial system that is playing a very essential role, I think, in making sure that this individual guilt is assigned, that punishment is meted out, and that there can be reconciliation. I think that was the whole purpose behind having uh, such a tribunal so that there could ultimately be the reconciliation of the various uh, people that were innocent as a part of this. So expectations was zero because nobody knew how it's going to work. As Secretary Albright says, uh, it was easy to vote for it, but then how to put it in motion? And then what happened? They hired investigators and lawyers and prosecutors and they put them in a hague and tasked them with investigations. And we had to find a way how to go about it. It was different than in Nuremberg, because in Nuremberg, as Secretary Albright said, it was a tribunal of the victors. They conquered the territory, and they can do pretty much what they needed to do without asking any questions. We were supposed to investigate the people responsible for the war in the former Yugoslavia, while the people responsible for that were still sitting in power. So we have to be very inventive about how to go about it. Can you move it? The grave is. You know, we identify the people responsible for that incident at Ovchara. It was the two military officers. The one on the left was okay, on the left. It was Colonel Merksic. He was the one who ordered the troops to pull out from from the area. And the one on the right was the one who stopped the Red Cross from coming to the hospital. The one in the middle was the commander of the platoon that actually transported the people to Ovchara. The, the guy in the middle was acquitted. The one on the left was sentenced to 20 years. And the one on the right to 17 was dropped to the 10 years for their responsibilities. Then you have the paramilitaries, 18 shooters we identified. They actually were prosecuted later by the Serbian authorities based on the evidence that we provided. It was an agreement between the prosecutor, Carlo Ponte, and the prosecutor in Serbia. It was after time that Milosevic left that they will prosecute them themselves, and the prosecution actually happened. Now we have Slavko Dokmanovic, a mayor of Vukovar, who we had evidence that he participated in the beatings of those people who were detained. He was indicted in a secret indictment. What happened at the time we, in, we issued about 70 indictments at the tribunal, but nobody was willing to arrest anybody. The NATO was at the time saying it wasn't part of their mandate because their mandate was to implement the peace after the Dayton into former Yugoslavia and then stabilize the situation. And the, the countries within the former Yugoslavia didn't want to cooperate with the tribunal for the reason I said, because some of those officials we were investigating were still in power. So Slav Korokmanovic was in that in a, in, a, in a seal indictment, and we were supposed to try to arrest him. The grave is, is up there somewhere. Okay. Yeah. But before we could arrest yeah. anybody, we have to find okay. the dead bodies. Here's another string. Because we can't indict and prosecute anybody without actually having the bodies. So we went back to Ofchara. By, it was asked by then the tribunal and the physician for human rights, is the NGO here from New York, that was actually doing the digging for us. And we went there back and tried to locate the grave and exhume the bodies. You see the procedure. It was not that easy to do the exhumation in a territory which was still hostile towards the international community. But we managed to find the grave. This may be it. Because we did put plastic over everybody. OK, good. So we were looking for what was left there in 1992 by the Physician Human Rights, the plastic which was put on the bottom of the test range. 
we did find it, and eventually, move it, and eventually we found the grave. Now, some of those images now is going to be very graphic, so if you don't want to watch them, I'm not going to uh, ask you to watch it. But what you see here is the mass grave of 200 people. I mean, they are the people like you and I. And they were in a hospital protected by the Geneva Conventions. And the reason why they were murdered was because of the news that somebody murdered 40 Serbian children, which was fake news. So what we have to do is we have to find a way, just to find a way how to come across the, the indicted war criminals. So by pure chance, I talked to a colleague of mine who was working on the crimes committed by Croats and the Serbs, and she didn't know that Slavko Dokmaj was indicted, and she met him in Belgrade and talked to him. And when we had a coffee, she said, I just talked to Slavko Dokmanovic. She gave me the contact details. We went to see the prosecutor at the time, it was Louis Arbor of Canada, who had a problem with the prison with nobody in, and 70 indictments, and the pressure from the international community to do something about it. So in a meeting, we agreed that we will try to arrest Slavko Rokmanovic, we will try to trick him because he was hiding in Serbia to the territory which was controlled by the UN, which was the Untais area, which was uh, the territory of Eastern Slavonia. So we had to go to see him to try to persuade him under pretext that we are investigating crimes committed by Croats and the Serbs and try to get him across the border on a territory which was controlled by the UN. It was a back and forth with him. Eventually, he said, he would go there to talk to General Klein, who was the administrator, because he had a house that he needed to sell. So we made an agreement with General Klein that he would send a VIP escort for him to bring him to negotiation about the sale of his house. So on the given date, Slavko Dokmanovic crossed the border of Serbia on the bridge over the Danube River, and there was a VIP escort waiting for him to go to negotiate the sale of his house. Can you move it? So we were waiting for him there. This is how it looked. The troops you will see there are the Polish Special Forces, which is called GROM. They are equal to Delta, Elf, Delta Force or SAS, they are trained anti terrorism and they were doing the protection of the headquarters in Vukovar. And we used them as a SWAT team to execute the arrest of Slavko Dokmanovic. So you see the operation now. Search for weapons. He had a bag with him that was taken away from him by the Polish police and given to us, which we didn't know there was a loaded gun in the bag. When I came on the scene, I read his rights. It's a legal obligation to read the rights. So it's called Miranda in the US here. We had a version of that for the International Tribunal. You need to inform him why he was there and what are the reasons for the arrest. With the great breaches of the Geneva Conventions, crimes against humanity and violations of the laws or customs of war for your role in the beatings and killings which occurred at Ovchara Farm near Vukovar on the 20th of November 1991. Do you understand?
I understood that uh, it's not true. Who transported this? Yeah, okay. So he was transported to the prison in The Hague and he was trialed and 10 days before the verdict he committed suicide. So the importance of the arrest, it was for the first time that after World War II, the war criminal was arrested. We proved to the world that it can be done. Nobody was harmed, nobody was killed, with the very little resources. So it allowed Justice Arbor, as a prosecutor, to go to the international community and to NATO and say, listen, if that bunch could do it, you know, why you cannot do it with the 60,000 troops in Bosnia and Herzegovina? Very, this very critical action that we took. We took it in our hands. And it's always like this, you know, if something needs to be done, if nobody else can do it, you need to do it. It has to be done. If nobody can do it, and you can, you need to do it. So there was a hearing before the court because, of course, the lawyers accused us of kidnapping and uh, the hearing ended up with a verdict that it is indeed legal to use a trickery when you need to get an uh, indicted criminal to the territory where you have a jurisdiction under one condition, that as soon as you put hands on him or her, you provide the due process, which we fulfilled because he was given the indictment in his own, own language, he was given the interpreter, and he was read his rights. So, it was success. What happened then? NATO wasn't able to argue anymore that cannot be done. Two weeks later, the SAS, the special forces of the British government, acted in Bosnia-Herzegovina to arrest three war criminals indicted in a sealed indictment. One of them was arrested. The other one was stupid enough to put up with them, so they shot him. And the third escaped to Serbia, but eventually was arrested and, and extradited to The Hague for prosecution. So our operation triggered the arrests of the others. The legacy of the tribunal. Was it perfect? Nothing is perfect in the world. Nothing is perfect in the world. We are just human beings. We all make mistakes. It was the same with the tribunal. Having said that, it was the most successful tribunal of all because we processed all the indictments and when it closed, there was nothing left. In contrast, for example, the International War Crimes Tribunal for Rwanda, our partner tribunal at the time, but still has some people at large and they are still trying to catch them. So the ICTY was indeed successful. Now the question is, was it perfect? You know, the perfect situation probably would be if the justice was delivered to the people then and then in Croatia and Serbia and Bosnia and Herzegovina by the local courts, because they will be probably the best. People will understand, it will be quick. But the political situation at the time was not at the stage where the Croats would arrest Croats and Serbs would arrest Serbs and Bosniaks would arrest Bosniaks. So the International Criminal Tribunal was a solution for that problem that brought some justice to the people. Now, if you ask me, if somebody murders your parents and rapes your daughter and burn your house and burn the whole village, is it good enough for you? The expectation of the healing process where such atrocities were happening to the people, and then you expect that a couple of years later, people will come together and start living in peace and brotherhood. You know, the expectations that we have for others are sometimes not reasonable because it takes a long time for people to come to terms with what happened to them. There are still thousands of people missing. Hundreds and thousands were displaced. The tragedy of the war in the former Yugoslavia was huge. And it's the same in Rwanda and all the other places where people are in war. And it affects everybody.
Now, was it a success? As I said, history will judge it, but it was certainly the beginning, because after that, the International Criminal Court was put in place. There are, there's a tribunal for Kosovo. There's a tribunal for Lebanon. They are struggling. They are struggling. But the ICTY was a success, and that's why the other tribunals were put in place. Let's let the history to judge. Those of you who are interested, I wrote a book which is called The Investigator, which in much more details deals with the investigation of the war crimes at the tribunal. And then my public speaking here is conditioned that I promote the book, which I gladly do. So the last presentation I will have is about 55 seconds clip about the book promotion. So if you don't mind, bear with me, I will do the quick promotion of the book. It's actually being sold here in the store. It is the story of a Czech investigator who left his job as a homicide detective in Prague to help in the hunt for the criminals of that war. He joined a team of international investigators, lawyers, and prosecutors intent on bringing to justice those responsible for the heinous acts committed in the former Yugoslavia. This story bears witness to the torture and killing of defenseless civilians, to finding and exhuming their mass graves, to investigating and arresting the perpetrators, and finally, to bringing them to trial for the International Tribunal in The Hague. Peace is not given. We all have to do something for it. People from Yugoslavia in Rwanda and other places didn't expect the war to happen. It came on them, destroyed their lives. So please, don't take the peace as something given to us. It's our obligation, all of us, to work for it so that we can live in peace. Thank you very much again to the Academy. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Zuro. Please don't go away. Please don't go away. Stay with us. Uh, I would like to applaud. We have with us, uh, maybe some of you noticed that there is uh, the Interparliamentary Union having some conferences and meetings here at the UN. Uh, I'm honored to address an applause to Senator Montevecchi of the Italian Republic. Thank you very much. We are honored to have, uh, we are honored to have one member of the Senate of the Republic uh, here to testify the importance of uh, gatherings of youth and the uh, gathering of young leaders engaged in changing the world. Thank you, Senator. Allow me now. The Italian Diplomatic Academy is humbled to address to Mr. Vladimir Zuro a recognition of his outstanding contribution in enhancing best practices in the pursuit of justice and legality in the world, to provide him with a recognition Mr. Vladimir Zuro, we are honored to provide you with the IDA. Thank you very much. I'm surprised and honored. Thank you. I didn't expect that. <laughs> 